Well, everything was true except the, when, when, when Stephen said that I'm in the, in the U.S. at the moment. I've been in the U.S. for 25 years. But I, I will, oh, okay. but I will forever have an accent. Yes. And uh, the most important difference between me and Frederick is that I'm heavier than him twice. Okay? So the body mass is different, so he is not in my category to start with. Now, the, um, the topic is exactly the same. And this is an entertaining session because you will hear totally different things, or almost totally different things. I, I, do, I do work uh, in the University of New Mexico, which is in the state of New Mexico. The state of New Mexico actually is in the United States. That's the only state in the United States that have the word USA on a license plate of the cars. Uh, every other state does it. So Nebraska is Nebraska, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. This is the only state that says New Mexico, comma, USA. So you should not get mistaken that it is on this side of the border. Okay? Now, the, um, the importance uh, of different sources of renewable energy uh, in the United States is, is, is appearing in this graph. And it shows that the, the American Southwest presents an, a rather diverse source or diverse landscape when almost any type of renewable energy source is being present. And, and that is why at the University of New Mexico, we have uh, several research centers and institutes that are devoted to uh, various sites of that, uh, of that technology or technology portfolios. Uh, so that's one specific. So the other specifics is that um, University of New Mexico is placed in the so-called uh, Rio Grande Technology Corridor that includes the other two schools in the state and Sandia National Laboratory uh, in, exactly in town, in the same city of Albuquerque, and Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, about 100 miles away. So that creates our intellectual landscape, so to speak, and uh, these are our natural collaborators and affiliations and, and so forth. The second thing is to put New Mexico on the map. It's actually in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but the map that we're currently living in is very exciting because um, variety or almost every single household name in automotive industry is rushing towards uh, fuel cell technology. And all these uh, uh, different labels that you see here uh, have associated themselves around several technology platforms. The uh, company that was called Ballard Power System six years ago was split into two, Ballard and Automotive Fuel Cell Corporation. And Automotive Fuel Cell Corporation is a wholly owned subsidiary of Ford and Daimler. And it's exactly the same building. It's next door in Barnave, uh, which is a southern suburb of uh, Vancouver. And uh, Nissan made a special arrangement with automotive fuel cell. So when Fraunhofer Institute will build here its center and the first plant of Daimler will start producing uh, fuel cell automobiles in North America, it is uh, no wonder that it will happen in Barnave, uh, British Columbia. So uh, these company represents the interest of the car manufacturers that are responsible for about 17 to 22 percent of the global output in automobiles. Uh, at the five years later, uh, Ballard came out of a uh, no-compete agreement uh, during that for that split and immediately affiliated itself with Volkswagen, so creating another um, powerhouse uh, also in that area, but of course affecting the European fuel cell market. The European fuel cell market, uh, BMW, um, made a contract uh, with or, or consortial agreement with Toyota Motor Company, which is a technology leader in the area of fuel cells, as you know, and we drove Mirai today, indeed. And uh, Toyota Motor Company um, will uh, have exchange of, uh, of a diesel, um, a small diesel engine for its um, sport utility vehicles on the European market, and Toyota cannot sell it in Europe uh, with a gasoline market, with a gasoline engine, in exchange providing BMW with a technology platform for fuel cells. And then there is an, another Japanese company that makes majority of its income by exports, that's Honda. 67% of what Honda makes as money comes actually from the American market, not from the Japanese market. That's why Honda affiliated itself with General Motors and it's running for the uh, fuel cell technology market both in Japan and in North America and probably in Europe, which I don't know, but I'm just inferring. So as you see, the world had set its chess and uh, my group actually has uh, non-disclosure agreements and ma materials exchange agreements or direct contracts with every single label that you see on this graph. So we're here and we're for real. The 
group itself styles it, uh, um, the group itself uh, styles itself as a as a full scale shop of making electrocatalysis, and we claim that we derive our wisdom from enzymatic electrocatalysis. And I had a fantastic uh, conversation yesterday with Ogosan on this. He was very much interested in that part of our business. This is the one that you are not going to hear today anything about because he didn't come to the session. Um, and we actually invest our knowledge into uh, studying metal nanoclusters, extended surface area or large metal nanoparticles, organometallic species or uh, carbon nitrogen uh, species for, for, uh, for um, electrocatalysis or systems that are oxides or uh, other um, ceramic type of materials. And this talk will mostly, almost entirely be, be devoted to the uh, iron uh, nitrogen carbon system, the one that Frederick was introducing to me. Our approach to uh, enter the field is by essentially changing the concave usual catalyst design to a convex open frame structure uh, electrocatalyst. And we did do that to actually facilitate transport because we know that at least for a time being, the catalyst that we're going to design will be inferior to platinum and we need to at least facilitate the transport properties of these catalysts in order to compete somehow along the larger length of the polarization curve. We have several technology platforms by which we manufacture our catalysts. And the most mature one is aerosol processing known as spray pyrolysis, or uh, actually aerosol assisted self-assembly in the spray pyrolysis apparatus. Spray pyrolysis is a continuous lamellar flow hot wall reactor that uh, essentially converts the species in aerosol phase as they travel through a furnace uh, with, with a you know, residence time that is determined by the flux and, and by the length of that furnace. It's very different, although it's from the same family, to spray drying. Uh, for those of you who are chemical, how many chemical engineers we have here? Do you have anybody's chemical? A few, you're a good girl. So the main difference between spray pyrolysis and spray drying is the spray drying is actually a turbulent flow adiabatic reactor. And this is a lamellar flow isothermal reactor. So from the point of view of processing scale up and, and control, it's a very different thing, but from the same family. So uh, the center that I currently lead, the U University of Mexico Center for Microengineered Materials, has a 27 years of contributed history to the nanomaterials that are derived by evaporation induced self-assembly in the aerosol uh, technology. So people who are listed here uh, made their, their kind of a path to National Academy uh, or to a senior fellowship with the uh, American Society of Chemical Engineers or become uh, you know, National, National Laboratory uh, leading fellows and presidents of the Electrochemical Society or me, uh, you know, based on that materials platform. So what I did, I essentially made electrocatalysts based on spray pyrolysis. And we demonstrated that in the late 90s, early 2000s, in a small company called Superior Micropowders that I joined to scale up the spray pyrolysis to an industrial um, level. And David Dericotti is my master student. He's the shortest student ever to walk out of UNM. And that's why we're using him here as a, you know, come on guys, it's Friday afternoon, just loosen up. Okay, so we're, we're using him here next to the bunker to show how big the bunker is. Actually, the, the height of the bunker is three meters and 55 centimeters, okay? So this apparatus can process one kilogram of carbonaceous material an hour. So if you wanna make electrocatalyst by this method, you can actually produce one kilogram an hour of catalyst. And the catalyst that is made by that method is actually manufactured by Cabot Corporation that absorb purchased essentially superior micro powders and the catalyst trade name is called Dynalist. That catalyst is one-to-one -one platinum rutinium um, nanoparticles deposited on carbonaceous uh, material and that carbonaceous material, which is actually carbon black, is packed into a spheroidal aggregates that are controlled by the, by the essentially the, the flow and the, and the atomization of the, uh, of the precursor. So that hierarchically structured material is currently actually uh, printed digitally into membrane electrode assembly by a company called uh, IRD that moved down to New Mexico and purchased from Cabot Corporation a plant 
to manufacture with digital printing MEAs, and that is facilitated by the spheroidal morphology of this catalyst. And uh, that catalyst is a part uh, of the, is, is the central part of the German company uh, Smart Fuel Cells that manufactures uh, in United States its uh, MEAs at IRD to provide United States Army with the so-called uh, power pack, which is a 20 uh, watt uh, DMFC uh, for, for the needs of the dismounted soldier. So um, that is done because United States military requires 33% of the actual cost to be manufactured on United States territory in order to sell their military supplier. So that's my little military industrial complex. The, um, the catalyst that can be manufactured by spray pyrolysis vary from single crystals to composites to agglomerates, and that's what I did, demonstrated for you, to ceramic materials with the various internal porosity. This is a panel of things that we have done with this map. And just an illustration of a practicality of this and relationship to uh, automotive industry is actually making an electrocatalyst of the family of the nickel zinc um, and by spray pyrolysis with a subsequent, of course, reduction because uh, with the nickel zinc family catalyst you will obtain nickel oxide zinc phase. Uh, that catalyst is actually rather smooth. It has a, a relatively low uh, surface area which makes it a fantastic catalyst for outgassing of nitrogen when you're using it in a system of hydrazine electrooxidation. This is a very important thing to know that every catalyst needs to be designed both chemically and morphologically for the process that is engaged. So this catalyst actually looks like a what? It looks like an electrolyzer catalyst. It doesn't look like a fuel cell catalyst because when you're oxidizing hydrazine, you're evolving nitrogen as crazy bubbles taking up, okay? Similar to electrolyzer. It's a fuel cell that works like electrolyzer from the point of view of mass flow. And when you do this catalyst well, put it on a catch in black, you obtain the highest possible uh, power performance of an alkaline membrane fuel cell that is done entirely without any noble metals at all. No platinum, no palladium, no ruthenium, nothing. So, this is just an example how one can engage metallic systems. And now we're going to switch towards oxygen reduction reaction, which, as Frederic uh, was telling you, is uh, usually exercised with noble metal catalysis uh, on the top of the volcano curve. And our purpose in life is to walk up uh, Mount Fuji uh, with uh, our favorite iron and to make it as close as possible. Slowly but surely, we as a snail are going to climb the slopes of Mount Fuji, as uh, Isakobayashi. Uh, set about 470 years ago. So people do think about this catalyst as defects in graphene nanosheets. Um, whether these defects contain iron or do not, there are two schools of thought, and there are romantics who think that can reduce oxygen to water uh, without using any transition metal. We'll leave that to history. And I belong to the party of realists that think that a transition metal is needed for the uh, coordination of oxygen, uh, at least at the adsorption stage. And I also think that it's needed for the actual charge transfer stage of the electrocatalysis. And all of it here down the road, uh, excuse me, Frederick, is a fantasy, including my own fantasy, because there is no direct evidence of any of those constructs. And there is actually an evidence that constructs like that are practically impossible because this so-called, what I call a dodule gap, is going to close itself immediately because it's actually it's energetically you know, undesirable for the material. So these things uh, can be discussed, uh, you know, spoken of. Uh, people like uh, Ted Holby, also a good friend of mine, fantasizes about two nitrogens and five, uh, excuse me, two irons and five nitrogens, or two irons very close to each other, and that being the active site. So there is a debate and a discussion. So let me start with what we really know. What we really know and learned through the years, and I have been burning this material since 88 or 87, um, the, we know that if you start pyrolyzing microcycles or other molecules that contain nitrogen and carbon, you're walking at least one out of a three pyrolyzation paths. So depending on the temperature time trajectory, 
you can walk through poly polymeric condensation or pyrrolic transformation, or you can actually achieve pyrrolization towards uh, graphitization of the material. And that most complex part is the one that actually yields the catalyst. Why the making the catalyst is still an art and not a science? Because you need to advance towards uh, you know, almost full graphitization of the material, but you need not let your nitrogen get incorporated as a graphitic nitrogen. So you need to arrest the process of graphitization of carbon nitrogen system just before you get your nitrogen to be entirely you know, diluted into the graphene sheet. So you need to retain nitrogen in some sort of a, uh, available for further coordination, mostly associated with defects, whether on the edge or in play, it's again a scholastic discussion. The way we make electrocatalysts uh, for fuel cells is a little bit different from what Frederick does. We uh, actually template them. We take silica particles, usually monodispersed silica or a mix of several monodispersed silica of our desire, and we deposit on them, either through a wet impregnation or through dry impregnation, the precursors, which are usually um, a metal salt, let's say iron chloride, and um, organic compound that contains both carbon and nitrogen. Let's call it amine, for the lack of a better word. Then we pyrolyze it, and then we etch away the silica. We can remill it and repyrolyze it second time, and if we are really, really eager, we can mill it again and pyrolyze it third time. And if we have a lot of graduate students that have nothing to do with their lives, we can do it four times, five times, six times. You know, the, by the way, the network, uh, our network in the, in the lab is called Plum and Slaves. Okay? So that's what we do. So um, in the process of this pyrolysis, what happens is that uh, the silica particles that leave the building, being responsible for the mean pore size in the, meso, in the mesoscale, because that's how we choose the silica but they are actually also smaller porosity in the walls of that that is formed by the departure of gases. And majority of the carbon is in this uh, turbostratic uh, formation, while some parts of carbon are highly graphitized, and one can hypothesize that they are highly graphitized because they formed around a remaining metallurgical iron that at the beginning uh, was in the matrix, but later was etched by the hydrogen fluoride. It, the conditions of the pyrolysis are critically important for formation of this catalyst. And here is a very simple illustration that if you have uh, a catalyst that is pyrolyzed at uh, temperatures that are below, let's say 1000 degree for this particular system, you obtain an iron nitrogen uh, a bonded catalyst. But if you pyrolyze a little bit more or too much or too long, you will obtain predominantly uh, metallurgical iron or iron carbide in that system. So that is uh, just a, a formal illustration uh, actually obtained nearby across the pond and on a different island here um, the, uh, that, that actually need to arrest the pyrolysis before you arrive to a full metallurgy of the iron. The other thing that you, uh, one need to uh, remember is that um, the catalysts um, essentially um, depending on the amount of iron uh, also can be obtained like this is very similar to what Frederick told you about uh, one gram or, or, or one percent or half percent or something like that uh, essentially the less iron you put in the catalyst the more uh, homogeneous material you obtain and this actually catalyst C corresponds to the half percent by weight actually it's 0 0.6 percent by weight uh, very close technologically to what Frederick was uh, discussing with you. And if you have more than that, you always obtain metal in the catalyst. So there is an optimal amount of iron that goes into these materials. And you see, we make them in totally different way that he does, but we are arriving at a very, very similar technological um, uh, yields. And, and, and that means that that technology becomes a little bit more mature. If you can make the same things more than one way, that means that that is the one that actually works. So uh, how do we think about the material? We think of the material as uh, defects in graphene sheet. And uh, these defects, uh, nitrogen defects, can be around uh, vacancies. 
um, double vacancy or single vacancy, or they can be around the edge. Again, defects that are simple incorporation of nitrogen into the graphitic sheet are of no interest. They have zero reactivity in oxygen reduction reaction. So only those ones that can coordinate the iron are of interest to us. Then how do we call this thing? Well, a similar material that has oxygen all over the place, people call it how? Graphene oxide, isn't it? Why don't we call that graphene nitrate? If we do that, I will have something to, you know, to get into Wikipedia with. So let's do it, you know. Uh, because uh, this material is as irregular. We, I mean, carbon nitrate, of course, it's a regular material. It's a chemical compound. And this is a total piece of shit. You know, graphene oxide is as ill-defined as lignin. It's a, it's a, it will be lignin if you oxidize it a little bit more. And, uh, and this, I think, graphene nitrate is a good name for it. Okay? But that's, that's a joke. You know? I'm not here to invent names. I'm here to understand where this iron goes. And iron can go into essentially three different places either in a double vacancies, and then you will see later with DFT calculation, it can sink entirely in plane and stay there in both valences, two and three, or it can go in a single vacancy surrounded by nitrogen, and then it has to stick out of plane because there is no room for it to sink in the plane fully. It will stick about 1.2 angstrom above the plane. Or it can go and coordinate on the edge defect with an unfilled uh, coordination number, and then one can fantasize how that infield coordination number is fully fulfilled down the road. In all cases, however, um, the iron that we think of is coordinated with nitrogen and we'll show you that there is a correlation between these two moieties in the, in, the, in the graphenic material. And I will only use the word moiety because none of these are actually chemical species. These are defects and they exist only in the context of the graphene sheet. They are not really present as molecules freestanding, and they can be equilibrated mathematically only if you assume periodic calculations. Now, uh, you can see that these moieties, or these essentially vacancies, when you have a single vacancy with the three nitrogen substitutions, are rather symmetric. It means relaxed, so they don't disturb the, 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 the system. Uh, and here is a, a, an evidence of an iron residing uh, in, a, in a double vacancy. So this, however, is not a catalyst. This is a model graphene sheet obtained on copper that has been bombarded with nitrogen and then bombarded with iron atomically just to obtain information whether such structures are possible. The understanding of the mechanism of the oxygen reduction reaction requires from us to carry uh, rotating ring depth disc electrode experiments. In order to actually prove that uh, uh, the catalyst has four electron uh, reduction to oxygen, one needs to carry uh, re experiments of oxygen reduction in a rotating ring disc electrode, <coughs> record the ring current, record the disc current, this is acid, this is, this is base, and do that at various loads at various loadings. Majority of the graduate students want to do this. They want to put as much as possible, uh, you know, uh, catalyst on the area, on the, on, the, on the electrode, and then record the least possible yield of peroxide. The only thing means that you deviated already from the conditions of Kotelki-Levich analysis because you made a brick, not a layer. And the second thing it means is that you just consumed your peroxide inside your brick. And only if you learn how to make 100 micrograms or better 50 micrograms um, um, you know, loadings on a one square centimeter of, of rotating disc electrode, then you can see that from a transfer number of four electrons with a decrease of that uh, loading, you will go to a transfer number of two electrons. <coughs> that only thing that shows you that when you put a little bit of the catalyst, the peroxide that you form doesn't escape from the matrix. And that is a clear evidence for some of these catalysts of the so-called two-by-two two mechanism. The two-by-two two mechanism can be of two types. One with two different, chemically different active sites, 
So it's a two by two mechanism of reduction of oxygen when peroxide is formed and has to travel between the first site and the second. This is a little bit of simplification because there could be a third site that can heterogeneously decompose hydrogen peroxide, especially in acid, that is not electrochemical. So you can lose hydrogen peroxide and you can create water, excuse me, oxygen locally by chemical decomposition. That is why when somebody makes a very bad catalyst, then actually the plateau in the rotating disk electrode goes down to 10, 12, and they have great activity. No, you just made locally oxygen. And that's why you are recording uh, uh, limited diffusion, limited current densities that do not correspond to the amount of oxygen dissolved in your electrolyte. This is stupid to claim as an activity the diffusion limiting current. It never has been an activity measure. So the other type of, uh, of kinetics is two by two mechanism on a single side. How do you go from here to here? Hmm? If your S1 side becomes more, uh, if your S2 side becomes less, less active and S1 side becomes less selective, you can actually reduce the peroxide to water on the first side. This is a very classic movement in polymorphous catalysts. And it's been studied tremendously in, in, uh, in the chemistry of petroleum uh, you know, ref refining. The interplay between catalytic activity and selectivity of multiple catalyst sites. I don't know why electrochemists don't simply adopt it. All the kinetic formula about that transition is written. You can just simply borrow it from heterogeneous catalysts and slap it there and publish it, whatever. Uh, probably not in nature and science. Uh, and then the most desirable one and, and the least common is uh, conversion of oxygen to peroxide, to, excuse me, to water on a single site. And that's the one that is desired. That's the one that happens on platinum. And that's the one that happens on a very, very few catalysts that are not platinum that I've ever seen. We also make this catalyst. Oh, I don't know what this slide came from, but let me skip it. We make this catalyst also by bone milling. Yeah, we don't need to do um, um, a weighting. Bone milling allows us to put together all the materials, the silica, the iron precursor, the uh, uh, nitrogen carbon precursor. But see what's happening. When you do really bone milling, you start a chemical transformation. Because all these, all these uh, uh, components are actually white powders. And after four hours of bone milling, you already have something that is red. So this is just a food for thought. And uh, pyrolysis, I mean, the system is absolutely clean. We, we only have iron because we put iron in it. So if you pyrolyze these materials without any iron, you get a fantastic catalyst for hydrogen peroxide formation. It's like a textbook material. You can make peroxide with it and sell the peroxide if you want. And putting more and more, uh, you know, essentially nitrogen, to the same amount of carbon makes the catalyst better and better. So this is the equivalent of what Frederick showed you of putting less and less iron. In our case, we simply are increasing the amount of carbon nitrogen precursor, which is the same effect. Okay? So the catalyst increases its activity and reduces the amount of hydrogen peroxide uh, released from the catalyst uh, when you increase the amount of nitrogen in it and you incorporate the iron uh, in that material better resulting in um, homogeneous distribution. What you also can see that in base, all these catalysts perform fantastically well. So the only problem is to find a company that really likes to make fuel cells that are alkaline. And at the moment, somebody wants to make alkaline fuel cells like Daihatsu, just across the pond, uh, you can supply them with catalysts. I already showed you a catalyst for hydrazine oxidation, nickel zinc. You can supply them with the catalyst uh, for oxygen reduction in alkaline media and create an automotive stack that is about uh, a, hundred, I mean, a 10, 12 kilowatt stack and uh, uh, performs uh, exactly like the Angivante Chemie paper on the individual, um, you know, MEA level. So, and this supposed to be 
the result of this performance. It's a deco deck truck by the Hatsu Corporation that is running around the spring gate. Uh, both catalyst, the anodic catalyst for oxidation of hydrazine and the cathodic catalyst for reduction of platinum, of oxygen, do not have any platinum, any other platinum group metal, are invented in my group, uh, scaled up uh, in companies in Albuquerque, manufactured, made into MEAs in companies in Albuquerque, and moved to Japan to be put under the hood of a Japanese, uh, you know, concept car. I, and I call that reversing the tides. Okay. So um, this has been eight years of collaboration with Daihatsu and three Tokyo Motor Shows in a row that are demonstrating the achievement of alkaline uh, fuel cells that operate on liquid fuel. And this is the first actually automobile uh, fuel cell vehicle that does not have platinum at all. So, we also try to understand how these catalysts work in addition to making them practical. Um, and uh, high resolution uh, atomic um, aberration um, corrected uh, microscopy allows us to observe that in those materials, iron is atomically dispersed. These particular individual bright dots are the size of a, uh, the diameter of an iron atom. And the dispersity of the carbon, iron, and nitrogen practically coincide. So whenever you have nitrogen, you have iron. And what Frederick showed you this result, the catalyst that we, but that we produce by this method has exactly the same Niels-Bauer signature as the catalyst that Frederick produced and, and published um, you know, in Nature Materials paper, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. So, there is no difference, in a way, spectroscopically and from the point of view of dispersity of the, of the transition metal in this practical catalyst. We also try to identify uh, with the density functional theory to see how oxygen binds and how essentially these particular defects uh, can be stabilized in a graphene matrix. The most importantly, we also compute the kinetics of oxygen reduction reaction and whether or not we can obtain four electron reduction on these defects. Please note that all these calculations are made with a periodic calculation, not Gaussian. This is all WASP calculations with periodic solutions. So at every single moment, quote unquote, the conductivity or the ability of this graphitic sheet uh, to conduct electricity and be ideally polarized is sustained. So this is critically important because essentially the Gaussian or closed cluster calculations do not allow you to maintain material that arguably is conductive. They, they cannot really be related to the Fermi zone of the solid state. It's just a molecule. It's like a molecule in the gas phase. Okay? And this is very important that these computations are done in a quasi-solid state. So the other thing that we use DFT for, and it was very, very successful, is to predict XPS um, lines or, or energy shifts, binding energy shifts for species that do not have molecular analogs. So we developed essentially the DFT to be able to actually address core level shifts. In general, DFT is made for valent electrons, but you can reformulate the potentials for the K and L layers and calculate XPS spectra with that. And that allows us to actually predict and, and observe by XPS species that other people have not been observing, like symmetrical iron entry and asymmetrical iron entry. When the asymmetrical iron entry, iron is in plane, and the symmetrical lane, one iron is out of plane. And this particular, both of these, however, in the XPS have exactly the same um, binding shape. So the um, ability to study these catalysts by electrochemical methods and spectroscopic methods and microscopic methods gives us the instruments to actually run a set of catalysts. Actually, the, this is just a part of the table. There are about 50 catalysts in this paper that have been processed 
with a principal component analysis to look at the correlations between iron and nitrogen and iron and different types of nitrogen in the lungs. And we have established direct correlation between the catalytic activity of the material demonstrated by e half and the amount of nitrogen. And there are direct correlations that I will not going to show you now, but you can look in the paper between the amount of iron and pyridinic nitrogen an anti-correlation between the amount of iron and pyronic nitrogen, an anti-correlation between the catalytic activity and pyronic nitrogen, and correlation between the catalytic activity and pyridinic nitrogen. But most of all, what is important is that this paper establishes the fact that there is more than one active site in each and every one of these catalysts. So we are not we do not have a system with a single active site. We have a pluri, kind of a pluricatalytic system. And I, I found the word multitudinous active sites, which is actually a GRE word. I didn't know it. I need to look at it in the dictionary. So then the next thing is to see whether you can have a direct observation um, of the iron, of the oxygen binding to exactly this particular um, you know, uh, line in the XPS spectra. To do that, you need to have um, a different depths, study different depths of, of penetration, uh, of uh, thus different energies, incidence energies of the XPS. You can do it on a, on a synchrotron XPS. This result are obtained at Bessie. Um, and we have actually acquired in situ XPS data that show presence of oxygen or binding of oxygen to the particular line that we attribute to the iron nitrogen species. This is a, as direct spectroscopic evidence as you can that oxygen binds to it. That also allows us to uh, produce a make, like a, um, produce a um, hypothesis of the catalytic mechanism that involves binding of the oxygen on the metal and secondary active site. And this secondary active site in this particular paper is not specified what it is because this particular paper has two principal authors. And these two principal authors didn't agree exactly what this active site is. And I'm going to tell you good things what, okay? Because I'm right. Um, so uh, the actual uh, mental image is that the material that we produce is an open frame structure, carbonaceous material, uh, relatively graphitic in content, uh, with, but with a high level of disorder, then has two types of defects. The one that were described to you by Frederic, the in-plane defects, and the one that were described by Frederic before, the, the edge defects. They both coexist. And we don't know which defects are more reactive and which defects are more stable. Just gener generically, we can suggest that in-plane defects are probably more stable, than edge defects. But this is from a general considerations. And uh, I, I have put here orange is like oxygen and blue is like a nitrogen and red is like iron. And I put here oxygen too because oxygen modulated or oxygen terminated carbon is also a catalyst for oxygen reduction to peroxide and it could be a catalyst for peroxide reduction to water. So participation of the oxygen moieties in this catalysis, especially under the assumption that there is a multiple active sites, is not to be outlawed. And these materials are highly oxygenated. So we still don't know where the, the most active sites are placed, whether in the pores or in the defects and the cracks or crevices or in the planes. Because we have observed materials in which even in sheet dominates, you have a high catalytic activity. And we, pres we also observe materials that have been highly turbostratic and also have a high catalytic activity. The only thing we know anecdotally that highly turbostratic materials or amorphous carbonaceous materials are more prone to corrosion and they lose activity faster. That's the only thing we can infer at this moment. So, um, this is like uh, our level of knowledge or lack of thereof. What uh, we clearly can say 
is that there is more than one active site with a comparable activity. We computed them all with DFT and they have very similar binding energies and very similar activities. And more than one mechanism is usually supported on, on the catalysts. On unsuccessful catalysts, these two mechanisms, and on successful catalysts, these two mechanisms. So you do not have a material with a single active site because it is a material and because the active site is actually a defect in that material. And um, now, understanding, of course, durability is a critical challenge. And I really praise Frederic, who gave you a very good lecture on how to tackle that challenge in a series of two or three very nice papers that address the, the chemical level of durability. And I will probably touch base only about one other durability level. Actually, what he was talking about stability. And I will just bring one more parameter to durability, which is the morphological stability. Okay? And that also, unfortunately, is a problem. problem. And then functional stability that also plays a role in the durability. And to do that, we need to actually have a practical catalyst. And the practical catalyst doesn't necessarily come from your most clean catalyst comes from the catalyst that is made from amine that decomposes at the highest possible temperature. So we choose this charge transfer organic salt called picarbazine as a source for our practical catalyst because we hypothesized that in order the material to be stable, it needs to decompose at the highest possible temperature. That was a, just a working hypothesis. So we pyrolyzed that thing. That, by the way, you cannot really dissolve it in anything. The only way to make this catalyst is like you make cement boil millet to death, and then fire it. But, you know, we make cement like that, and cement is the most, you know, made material on Earth, the highest production. So the material looks exactly like the ones that were described, has high, catal high catalytic activity, and somewhat higher yield of, uh, of peroxide, but still at the 4% at the yield of peroxide was industrially acceptable. It actually looks like a phase after double etching, that is predominantly graphitic. It has a lot of sheets of, 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 of a, of a graphitic-like structure and a minor, minority phase of about 10, sometimes 15% of uh, staggered cups, multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And just for you to notice that these flakes of gra graphitic flakes are actually at this scale and these carbon nanotubes are macroscopic compared to the graphitic. These are actually desirable. They, they probably grow on the grains of iron that are obtained during the initial steps of pure metallurgy of iron. Uh, and we actually then learned how to make plenty of those and increase their content in the material because they give connectivity to the material and uh, increase the uh, integration of the material in the catalytic layer and better conductivity, electrical conductivity of the catalytic layer. So this phase has no role in electrocatalysis, but it has a role in making a catalyst layer. Um, the catalyst works well in our hands. It is very important for a catalyst to work well in the hands of your industrial partner, because that is what matters. And in the hands of your industrial partner, this catalyst has to pass the target point of the Department of Energy for a go-no-go -no -go decision to continue your program and to get another couple of million dollars and by th this is the first catalyst ever to reach the target that was prescribed by DOE two years ago for non-platinum electrocatalysts. And in that sense, this is the first practical electrocatalyst. And it reaches that target not in the hands of the researcher, because that is the condition of the Department of Energy Developmental Protocols. It has to reach that target in the hand of the industrial partner. So, unfortunately, that means that you need to work with them, tailor yourself to them, and make sure that they love you for a long time. This doesn't happen from the first, you know, mailing of your... You cannot just simply mail your catalyst to an industrial partner and expect that in one day they will achieve the results. It's a highly iterative process. But when it happens, then you learn that your stability in cycling in the so-called test driving protocol between 0 0.6 and 1 volt uh, is practically meeting all industrial standards 
and stability in um, stop and um, start and stop between one volt and 1.5 volt does not meet the industrial standard. But on the other hand, this is a comparison between industrial catalyst, highly advanced platinum and carbon, made by a company called TKK, which is an industrial standard. This is how TKK catalysts burn on the, under the same condition, between 1 and 1.5 volt. Arguably, our catalyst burns less. But here you start from excellent catalyst, you end with a bad catalyst. Here you start with a bad catalyst and end with a piece of shit. So that is the difference. The reality is that any carbonaceous catalyst that has carbonaceous support or carbonaceous backbone or a matrix will decompose or will you know, essentially oxidize under those conditions. Hence, I think that system level solutions are needed to mitigate the start and stop um, problems of the, um, of, the, of the fuel cells. And those are available. They just simply are expensive. This catalyst actually is more heterogeneous than the one described before. Uh, it does have uh, nitro carbon, uh, excuse me, iron nitrogen um, types of species, but it does have also iron iron species, as shown here in the uh, in the exafs uh, in Zane's spectra. And uh, also, Frederick was kind uh, enough to provide uh, the uh, Mosbauer spectra of this catalyst. That, in addition to the two doublets that were discussed, D1 and D2. It has a gamma iron, uh, an alpha iron, and, and also iron carbide. So it, it is more heterogeneous as a material that can be confirmed also by the complexity of the XPS uh, nitrogen spectra. What is very important to note that the practical implementation of these materials in fuel cells depends on the pore size distribution. And here is uh, three catalysts that are chemically undistinguishable. They have the same spectroscopic signatures. They have the same, uh, you know, it can be evaluated by spectroscopy, by, by content, uh, the same way. They have the same performance in rotating disk electrodes. But when you start making MEAs with them, this is fantastic, this is okay, and this doesn't work at all. And the main difference between these catalysts is actually the amount of the micropores. And that appears to you as the fuzziness of the image, isn't it? Like a sharp contrast image, high fidelity image, and this looks like a something fuzzy. In order to get out of this personal perception, we have developed actually methods of uh, determining and linking the image or image analysis to local morphology, surface roughness, to calculate torturosity and porosity of the catalyst from SEM images. And then we cross link, we cross reference this information from the microporosimetry uh, of these catalysts. And in a both experimental and theoretical work with fitting with our partner Scott Calabresi Barton from Michigan State, we have shown that the catalyst is. Uh, essentially very sensitive to the amount of uh, micropores. And during the processing of the catalyst into layers, the mesopores of these catalysts are also undergoing a change. So essentially, we have learned how to process these catalysts into MEAs. And then is when you can actually outsource the catalyst to a company. And uh, we did that with a company called Paharito Powder, and that is a stupid name that I gave the company when I was skiing with Piotr Zell and I on Pajarito Mountain, which is the ski area of Los Alamos on a powder day. We were skiing white powder, and we call this company as a black powder. You know. Pajarito means little bird, but that's the name of the ski area. Uh, Bar Halevi, who is the CTO and vice president of the company, is uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, former postdoc and uh, research faculty with us. And the company has the illustrious board uh, of pretty much who is who in non-platinum electrocatalysis North America. It licenses uh, two patents from Los Alamos, 12 patents from UNM, one patent from Michigan State, four patents from uh, Northeastern University, and three patents from the National Institute of Research of Canada. By that, it's a portfolio holder for the electrocatalyst development uh, in the continent. The two products that this company had launched, and you can buy them, are based on two packets of UNM 
uh, patterns. Uh, one uh, described the catalyst that had like a two horns in Niosbauer, and the other describes the catalyst that has is more complex. You know. So uh, both of them are produced um, uh, by the company, and you can pick up the phone and order. They can make one kilogram in three weeks on order. And there is nobody in this earth who wants to buy one kilogram of this catalyst. So if you need it, call them. Okay. Um, the most important thing about this catalyst is that they actually work uh, in a rather stable format. There is a little trick about it. We simply do not report what happens to the catalyst in the first several hours of operation. Uh, and uh, that actually, we, we claim that to be the uh, working uh, of the catalyst into the NEA. And then in, in a hundreds of hours uh, in the hands of this uh, small company, or in a, a hundred of hours in our hands, this catalyst operates without loss of any activity. And it's similar, uh, illustrated by a relatively small loss of activity under the uh, DOD uh, protocols of operation. Because uh, many industrial partners would like to see uh, these hold of tests, and the Department of Energy wants to see these uh, tests that are um, Cyclation. So now what, what we know uh, is what happens during this degradation. And what happens during this degradation is that your porosity of the catalyst changes. It, it redistributes itself. So the porosity actually decreases and the roughness of the catalyst increases as you, as you work through the... What means essentially, if you translate it into the pore size distribution, it means that you are uh, collapsing your mesopores and small macropores, and you're increasing your micropores by etching. And that is the pity of this catalyst, because what happens then is, uh, it is not described in this paper, it will be described in the next paper, is that the flooding of the catalyst is directly proportional to the amount of uh, micropores the volume of micropores. Now, so these two components of durability have nothing to do with what Frederick said. It is not the chemical stability of the active site. This is a materials durability. First of all, it's a materials instability, restructuring of the pore sizes, and I think I tried to convince you that the pore size distribution of this catalyst is important for its, for its operation in membrane electrode assembly. And the second thing what happens, not illustrated here, is the functional degradation of the catalyst, which is related to moving of the line of capillary condensation from the, from the microporous layer into the catalytic layer, which essentially means in plain English, flooding the catalytic layer. Because if you form water in, in micropores, right, if you form water in pores that are smaller than 100, uh, excuse me, 10 nanometers, there is no way you will take that water out. And if a substantial amount of catalyst active sites are in those pores, your oxygen will never reach them without you know, diffusion through water, at least. So remember the agglomerated flooded core shell model that Frederick was showing. That stops working and catalyst moves into a fully flooded and the performance goes down, falls. Okay, so at this moment I will stop and uh, I will uh, thank my students and my postdoctoral fellows in the research faculty who contributed to this work and the funding for this particular segment of our research that came from Department of Energy in collaboration with Sanjeev Mukherjee who is a PI, Scott Calabrese Barton, Nilesh Dale from Nissan and Bar Halevi from Pajarito Powder and a large project funded by the Hatsu Corporation, which was called Creation of Anionic Fuel Cells for Earth, under the leadership of Hiro Tanaka, who is right now uh, a first-year professor at KGU uh, just across the channel. Thank you very much. <laughs>